You are listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagberdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome listeners back to the SDSU podcast. This is episode 75 and it is a special one. It is our Father's Day episode, our second annual Father's Day episode. We are really excited to be able to get two father-son combinations for this episode. So it is it is the first episode we have had that's included four special guests. And we were able to do two father-son combinations, one on the football side, one on the basketball side. They were interviewed separately. Really an interesting and fun week of interviews, uh, not just talking to the players about their, you know, current Aztec careers, but also about the the, the influence that their, that their dads have had on those careers. First on the football side, we started with Cade Bennett, starting left guard for the football team, and then his father, Dave Bennett, as well. And then we shifted over to basketball with uh, Jaden Ledee, who decided to come back for his super senior season and help San Diego State reach another Final Four. And then we also spoke to his father, Herb Ledee, played college basketball in the early 90s, and is a has also done a lot of coaching with boys and girls basketball over the years and still does. So it was really a great perspective, not to, to talk to Herb about, you know, his son from that perspective, but also just from an overall basketball knowledge perspective. Four great interviews. I know you guys will enjoy them all because Paul and I definitely did. Uh, let's get right to it, starting with Cade Bennett. We want to welcome Cade Bennett to the SDSU podcast. How are you doing today, man? Pretty good. How about you? We're doing great. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time. You're entering your junior season. Uh, you're second as an Aztec. You know, as, as you're starting kind of the summer phase of the offseason, what are you uh, looking forward to most? Oh, man, you know, we we know we weren't good enough last year. We're just we're trying to be the best we can be. All the guys are working hard and we're just trying to be the best we can possibly be this year and take that Mountain West championship. You know, we will we definitely want to get to San Diego State, but, you know, your your college career started at Oklahoma State. You spent two years there. You know, it's a big 12 school. You know, it's got a lot of national recognition. You know, what was that experience being part of such a big program in that atmosphere? Oh, you know, it it was great. I mean, it, it wasn't exactly my cup of tea per se, but, you know, I, I'm grateful for that time. I mean, it helped me mature and develop as a player and just a person. Uh, really took me out of my comfort zone just being, you know, from Arizona, going to a place like Oklahoma. And, you know, just playing real big time football, it, it was it was awesome. I mean, I made some great memories and great friends there, so I can't complain. Last year, we had Coach Goff on 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 the podcast, and and he said basically that Oklahoma State didn't want to lose you, and that that you know San Diego State was really excited to get you. Why ultimately did you choose SDSU? You know, San Diego's actually been a vacation spot for me, and my family for years uh we've gone here for the fourth of july you know pb stayed over there and you know since i don't know probably seven eight years it's been a long time so it kind of was just a perfect uh storm of events they were one of the first schools to reach out to me in the portal and just i thought about it i'm like that would be pretty nice playing football in san diego you know the weather and the city's great. You got great food here and every, and it's close to home for me. So I never really wanted to be, to stay at home. You know, some guys like to do that, but I just, I felt like I had to get away, but it was close enough, you know? So I, I just, I dug it and I, I really liked coach Goff and, you know, him and coach Hall and Hope, they got, a, they're running a great program over here. And they just win, win, win games and got a good history going. So I was excited about it. Tell us more about uh, playing under Coach Goff, former NFL lineman, um, and what what you know that year has been like for you. Oh, it's been awesome. I mean, he 
he's great at just, you know, slowing the game down for you, making you understand things. And he's got that perspective, you know, he played for so long. So, I, I mean, I really appreciate him. He's he's done a lot for me and helped me develop into a player that I am today. And he, he, you know, he really cares. He's not going to take it easy on me. He's going to go hard on me and make sure, um, you know, I'm always up to speed and always doing the best I can. He's not going to let me slack. So I appreciate him for that a lot. You know, you came here last year. And you start at left guard right away and start all season. Was that something you expected? Did that surprise you that you were able to just to start right away? And then, you know, what was your expectation just in general for the season? Yeah, you know, I mean, he didn't guarantee me. No one can really guarantee you a starting spot. If someone does, it's probably a lie. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, he told me, he's like, look, you're going to have – a, you know, a real chance to compete and uh I like the opportunity I mean I just came out here and put my head down I went to work because transferring to a new program is different you know you got new coaches you got to prove yourself all over again you know so I I just did what I had to do and it ended up working out for me you know the Mountain West had a lot of good defensive linemen last year some of them on your own team that you probably went up against in practice, but from the other teams, was there a particular one or two guys that you that stood out to you that you played against? There were a couple guys. I thought um, I thought that DN from San Jose was a pretty good player. Uh, Fihoko, uh, he was a pretty good player. I I didn't get to. I pulled against him a few times, but you know I didn't get a ton of reps against him just being a guard. I thought Matt Locke from Boise was a, he was a, you know just a veteran player. Uh, Dom Peterson from Nevada was pretty solid too, and obviously Jonah and Keyshawn were, and Justice were all studs. So going up against them, I mean, they were probably the best D linemen I was going up against all year. So it helped having them at practice all the time. You know, you mentioned that yet last year was not the year that that everybody was expecting. Didn't doesn't meet what you know the standards of the program. You know, have you guys identified any of where that some of those inconsistencies on the line came from, and and you know how are you guys addressing them as you're moving into this season? Yeah, you know we have actually we've been watching a ton of film as a unit um, with Goff, um, figuring out where things went wrong, why this didn't work. Maybe we could change our footwork here, do this here, um, ton of stuff. We've been meeting two, three times. You know, meeting a bunch. All kind, all the time, and just trying to figure out different ways. And we were young. Uh, I'm not going to say that was an excuse, um, but you know, we just. I think we all realize we need to be better, and everyone's pretty locked in right now. So I, I feel good about this group of guys we got. And of course, the the other big news from last year was a new offensive coordinator coming in this year. Uh, with Coach Lindley and, and you know, he and Coach Hoke are both talking about, you know, um, having multiple tight ends, returning to a little bit more of the physical physicality. As an offensive lineman, is is that sort of like run first physical approach, man? Is, is that music to your ears? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's definitely I feel like more the emphasis this season. They want it they want it to be on our back, you know, they want the season to be on our back and and you know, some people might not like that pressure, but I think it, it keeps us driving, it keeps us moving, you know. We know we we have to be on top of our game. So and you, you know, there's nothing better than breaking a big run. So right off your butt, you know, you can't complain about that. Yeah, and and you know the nice part too about it is it's true, right? Yeah, the, yeah. for every every team across America, it it always begins up front. Um, yeah, so yeah, no doubt. I've heard all the time that offensive linemen prefer love run blocking more than pass blocking. Is that is that accurate? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's definitely certain runs I think people prefer. Pass pro is, you know, it's a lot very technical and for some people it can be nerve wracking, but I, I found some some comfortableness in, in my ability for pass protection. But, you know, run blocking is obviously it's super fun. I mean, just dominating someone against their own will. It's, it's a good time. 
when you when you like look back at at the different games that you played and stuff like that is it what kind of blocks come to your mind i mean do you think about you know you just mentioned you pulled a couple of times is it that was kind of full head of steam explosion on guys i mean what what are the things that you tend to remember yeah you know we had a couple big um i think of like the toledo game a couple big pulls in that game and san jose you know, there was a couple games where we would just have some big breakaway runs. Uh, and that's a blast. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. Last year, you had a super senior, Alma, next to you at center. First team all-conference. You had BCD next to you at, as a left tackle. He's obviously moving. Looks like he's moving to right tackle. You've got a new center, new left tackle. You know, you're you're kind of, other than BCD, you're kind of one of those veterans now on the offensive line. And so do you, is that something you're looking to do and take on more of a leadership role this year as you're trying to get them comfortable next to you? Yeah, you know, I've been trying to just lead by example and, uh, you know, just with my work ethic and do just show the younger guys, you know, because it's, I, I'm not the most talented guy in the room. I mean, that's, you know, I don't have the most ability, but if you put your head down. I mean, offensive linemen don't need to be the most talented guys. You know, you just need to be strong and you know, use your head and fo- be focused, you know. I think you're selling yourself short there. I was going to say, you're, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. conference, second team. I think I've seen you on this a bunch of places about the top guards in the country. What, like, as you're heading into, it's your junior season, but it's really your fourth year in college. What is, is there anything particularly that you're like, this is the year I want to, I want to do this or I want to work on this? that maybe could get seen by scouts and end up, you know, at the next level? Definitely, yeah. I'm just, this year, I mean, even golf, me and Emma talked about this, I'm just trying to emphasize running through everything, um, just staying low and running through everything, keeping my hips straight, keeping my balance, you know, just really trying to become a dominant blocker in all aspects. Are there any particular... Offensive linemen that you study, uh, try to kind of, you know, pick up things from? Yeah, um, I actually, I used to work with a guy named Scott Peters out of high school, and um, he trained some dudes like Brandon Sheriff. Uh, He's on the Jags now. You know, he's a stud. He always told me, hey, watch him. So I, I, I watched him when he was on the Redskins. Now I guess watching the football team, but, um, and then now he's on the Jags. I watched him a good bit. I've also watched, I used to watch Marshall Yonda quite a bit when he was on the Ravens. Those two guys, I would probably say. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are wondering about Jalen Maiden, his progression, um, you know, from, I mean, you, I can still say the words, but they still don't fully make sense to me that he could switch positions, go all out on safety, and then a week later, now he's playing quarterback. And not only does he play quarterback, but but he does very well. And um, I think there's very few people anywhere who could have pulled off what he was able to pull off. And so people are really excited about his season. Uh, what are maybe some things you've seen from the off season and maybe that transition for him that you could tell us about? Yeah, you know, it's been nice to just have a full off season with him as the quarterback. You know, obviously he was playing safety, so it was different. But, you know, it's just it's made us a lot closer, I think. Me and him are pretty good buddies. and. He he's just a good he's been a good leader presence for everyone so that's been really awesome to see. No doubt, man. And uh, you know, part of the headlines obviously about around San Diego State is the athletic director came out a few weeks ago talking about that San Diego State switching conferences in 2024. You obviously have an el- year of eligibility left if you choose to use it, man. What are just your general thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I mean that'd be awesome. Uh, whatever chance I got, I mean, I'm trying to play at the next level. And if that would help me get to the next level, you know, playing against who some deem, I think we have good competition in the mountain West, but I mean, if some would deem, Oh, you need to be playing these bigger guys and so be it. You know, I'm not scared of that. And I know we can handle that. I've played against, I don't think there's that much of a difference to be honest with you. So I played against guys like that all the time at Oklahoma state and everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't stress me out. I'm excited for the opportunity. Uh, NIL obviously is also a big topic. 
you know, you you made dents into that road. You know, I know you have your own merch, your your logo on the NIL store. I think there's some other stuff that you're partnering with. And so how as a player, you know, when you have that opportunity, um, how how do you go about choosing what you do want to support, what you uh, want to take part in uh, while when you're not focused on, you know, getting better? Yeah, you know, um, people will approach you, whether it's Instagram messages or emails, whatever, and uh, I'll hear them out, just hear what they got to say. Um, obviously, the product that they're selling or whatever, I, I need to try it and see if I actually believe in it. So, you know, if, if it checks all those boxes and the contract is good, you know, I'm obviously all for it. What are what are some of the some of the um, nil things that that you've been involved in? You yeah, know, so I have, this com- <laughs> I have this company uh, called Mars Energy Cream. It's like a caffeine based um, company. They they treat me really well, and uh, you know I promote their product. It's a great product. It's just good for longevity. It gets in your system. Put it on your neck. Gets in your system. It keeps you wired and awake. Um, it's really kind of like a five hour energy without drinking anything. Let's put it that way. And then also this company, Smarty Oats, I actually, mm-hmm. it's like an overnight oats deal, you know, and they send me a bunch of stuff and I promote it and it's good, good stuff to eat for breakfast too. So good, healthy protein filled oats. So, so awesome. those are just a few examples. Yeah. Yep. yep. We have some rapid fire uh, non football questions. You ready for those? Yeah, of course, of course. What is your favorite food? Favorite food? Maybe like, uh, maybe either sushi or like, I like me a good like eggs Benedict. Those are solid. Can't complain. Pizza, can't go wrong with that either. Egg Benedict. I don't think we've heard that one before. No. That's a new one. For sure. No, I, I was uh, gonna say with, with the sushi, just make sure that you don't have it with Kanye West. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll pass wild, on that. I just saw that. I just saw that today. I was like, no way. <laughs> yeah, I'll pass on that. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Uh, favorite movie or TV show? Ooh, movie. It's got to be Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That's probably my favorite. Mm-hmm. TV show. Sopranos or like Entourage, those are good ones. Definitely, those are two of my favorites. Favorite musical artist? Ooh man, probably Frank Sinatra. Can't go wrong with that. Great answer. Great probably answer. Hard, hard to beat. Yeah, that but, is that is a great answer. I didn't expect that answer, but no, I, I did not. Expect I mean, I listen to all genres, but I mean Frank Sinatra. His music's timeless. No, that where did you get? I mean, how did you get into Frank Sinatra? Oh, I don't know. I <laughs> I, I listen to all kinds of music. I don't. I, I really couldn't tell you, but I, he's he's cool. I, I like all of his music. It's just the him. You know, I like I like really all genres: rock, hip hop, everything. So, all right. I I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and ask for those of you who who can't. You know, obviously, you're listening to this, not seeing it. Uh, behind QK, there are some pretty epic album covers up on the wall. Um, oh yeah! So I I was honestly expecting you to go there, and and then and then you drop Sinatra. So I mean, tell me about tell me about what's behind you, man. Those are some. I mean, right, Andre? I'm I'm I'm, I'm correct. So, right? I, is... so I'll tell you what I, I see: Stankonia, Outcast. Yeah, I see yeah. T- Tupac, All Eyes on Me. I see D- Doggy Style. Yeah. I can't see what the other one is because there's like a, a, sh- a sh- it's shaded. What's the one next to Stankonia? Uh, I got that's Lord Finesse, uh, The Awakening. I got 1999 by Joey Badass. There you go. Got Chronic, uh, Good Kid, Mad City, uh, Forest Hills Drive, 2014, 2001, Dr. Dre. I got a couple up there. Yeah, are those yeah. actual record covers, or are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so you have a record player? I do. Yeah, back at home. I just like collecting them. They're cool for you know the wall and stuff. They are. They they're really cool. Just classic albums. Yeah, they're they're pretty sweet. Yeah. 
Out, um, other than outside of football, you have a favorite professional athlete? Mm, favorite professional athlete outside of football. I like I like Justin Gaethje quite a bit in the UFC. He's an Arizona kid too. I like him quite a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, really, the only sport I pay a ton of attention to outside of football is the UFC. To be honest with you, I can't really watch. I, I mean, I watch the finals, you know, and I watch March Madness, but that's about my extent with basketball. What about or I watch till the Suns lost. Let's put it that way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did you were you born in Scottsdale? Yeah, uh Phoenix Scottsdale area. Yep. Yeah. So what about I've favorite, favorite hobby? Yeah. Favorite hobby. I like watching movies, playing video games, um the beach is cool here, that kind of stuff. And then um what are you studying at San Diego State? Like what's your major and when do you plan on graduating? Uh, so I'm majoring in social science. I'll, I'll finish that up this next May. So I'll be graduating next May. Cool. There you go. I got a social yep. science degree from San Diego State. <laughs> so, how many years? Did, how many years did it take you? Well, really, we got to uh, bring that up. For my, it'll be my normal four. No, that wasn't for you, man. That was that was for me. It took me ten years. Okay, Kate. It was a, it was an inside <laughs> joke. It, to it took me ten years uh, to get my four year degree. And, you know, it's a little Tommy Boy thing. You ever seen Tommy Boy? You know, a lot of yeah. people go to school for eight years. Yeah, they're called <laughs> doctors. I'm one of the other ones. You know, I was a night student, Andre, okay? okay. You, should, you should be praising me for my perseverance, not putting me on the spot because Kay did it in his normal four years. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't pull that off, man. But uh, this is obviously our Father's Day episode. So when I, a few questions about your dad, man. Um, t- just talk to us a little bit about just the role that he played in your development um, first as a football player. Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing. My dad actually, uh, he never played football. I mean, he might have as a young, but he never played tackle football. But, you know, he's always been super into it um, just because I think he was told when I was younger by one of my coaches, like, hey, kate has got a chance to be a Division One athlete, you know. And so he kind of told me that and was like, look, like, if you want to, you know, have a chance of doing something special, like, you got to work. And so my dad would always make sure – I was always in a sport, and if if I wasn't in a sport, I would train at this gym, uh, Infinity Fitness, way back in the day with one of my high school coaches. Um, He wasn't at the time, obviously. I started training with him when I was in sixth grade. But, yeah, I mean, he would – my dad would always just make sure I was always working. And You know, when you're a young kid, you don't want to do that stuff, but it definitely helped me in the long run. Um, So I'm really appreciative of him for that. And then, you're the you're the youngest son or son of how many children? I have an older sister and an even older brother. Yeah. So yeah, I'm the youngest. How, how does that work? Being the largest and also being the youngest. I mean, you know, <laughs> how do you? <laughs> yeah, you know, my brother used to beat up on me, but not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, it's definitely interesting. I've had a lot of people like question whether I was even a part of my family, but it's pretty funny. <laughs> I I get that all the time because I'm six foot six, and like my parents are not anywhere near as tall as me. And they're like, "How did you end up so tall?" And I'm like, "I don't know." They're like, "Are you sure you're really their kid?" And I was like, "I don't know. I wasn't there. I can't remember that." Yeah, yeah. you guys gotta be careful with the ancestry.com stuff when you're older. Uh, but and, and then just just as as a person man what what is what is your dad how, has meant to you just in that relationship yeah you know he's been great i mean he's been super supportive of me my whole life uh he's always been one of those dads that you know he worked from home for a lot of his life um because he would work with people overseas and he'd always be on calls and whenever he'd be on his calls he'd come by my practices all the time and watch you know he'd be one of the few dads out there and you know, he's always just been there, been around, been present in my life, which I'm grateful for. Absolutely. So now what we'd like to do is we're going to finish up this part of it. Uh, this will actually come out on Father's Day. Um, and your dad will not have heard this um, until it comes out with everybody else. Uh, we just want to kind of turn the podcast over to you. And if you'd be willing, man, just to direct a message to your dad. Um, and, and you're welcome because, you know, you've already taken care of your Father's Day gift. 
<laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, hey, Dad. Uh, I'm just saying happy Father's Day. Uh, like I said, I appreciate everything you've done for me. You know, you've been super supportive my whole life. And whatever decisions I wanted, I mean, you were always supportive of me, but you also gave me good guidance. So I really appreciate that. Well done. I was, I was getting a little choked up. That's great, man. Thank you so much. Great interview. Uh, best of luck as you're uh, going into the summer and doing all those things for the Aztecs, man. But uh, just really, really great to have you, man. I finally get to you know have this conversation. Of course. Appreciate you guys having me on. Have a good day, man. All right, you as well. We want to welcome Dave Bennett to the SDSU podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Hi, Andre. How are you doing? Hi, Paul. Come on, brother. Thanks for taking the time. You are obviously the father of Cade Bennett, starting left guard for San Diego State. You know, we we just got done talking to Cade. You know, we went through kind of his his career arc. You know, he started at Oklahoma State for the first two years before making his way here. You know, what were your thoughts on his journey, how his journey has evolved, you know, starting at Oklahoma State and, and that atmosphere and that power five, you know, national recognition uh, and then now at San Diego State? Yeah, I'll be real honest with you. I was surprised he picked uh, Oklahoma State because he <laughs> said he wanted to go to five different official visits. He went to Oklahoma State and he loved it so much, loved the coaching staff. He ended up committing there. It was different for him, I think, you know, being a yeah. small town college town and those type of things but um, the environment was very different you know the, a lot of people were interviewing him because it's you know that's in Oklahoma they only have college football you know, yeah. you know football so they're pretty crazy about their football there we actually liked it a lot you know Kimberly and I we lo loved it we ended up buying a house there <laughs> wow. believe it or wow. not because I could work from my house I could work from my house so we bought a house there and you know tried to help him as much as possible when he was there but for him um, he had quite a few offers. And, and in fact, when he committed to Oklahoma State, the funny thing is Michigan tried to flip him. They were contacting him every day because his senior film, he came out of the shoot, his senior film, and he was just wrecking guys. It was, you know, 20, 30 pancakes a game. And they were nasty yeah. ones, you know, pulling and just destroying guys. And and it was uh I, I, I was proud of him because he made his commitment, stuck with it, you know, and went there. And even though other schools were trying to get him to decommit and recommit someplace else. So, but it was a great experience. Um, he learned a lot. I think they developed him. They got him stronger, more technical. He probably came into San Diego State pretty technical as a, you know, as a new kid. Um, and I think, you know, Oklahoma State did that to him. Plus, the defenses he went against the two years that he was there were some of the best in the country. They were like two and three in the country when he was there. So imagine going against those D tackles and D defensive ends. It really helped him a lot. You know, and then, you know, he comes to San Diego state, I believe San Diego state recruited him out of high school. So he, there was some, you know, recognition there, but you know, no offense to San Diego. It's not Stillwater, Oklahoma, when it comes to college football, you know, what has been your experience as, as Cade going through, you know, living in, living and playing in San Diego. You know, we've loved it. It's closer for us. We can actually drive there, believe it or not. So we we love it. We spend most of our summer there. I don't know if he mentioned that to you. We spend a lot of time there. In fact, we'll be out there in a couple of weeks or 10 days or so. You know, the, I know the program's not as big as, as Oklahoma State, but the fans that are loyal fans are just the same. They're no different. Yeah. I mean, they I get DMs from some of the fans and they're great fans. They love their team. They love the Aztecs. The coaching staff and the culture, I think, have been outstanding. Coach Hoke and Coach Goff and even Ryan Lindley and heck before him were, have been great to work with. Sumler was the guy that actually offered him, you know, because mm -hmm. Sumler was in Arizona. And Sumler's just a great dude. We love that guy. Just the coaching staff has been fantastic. I, I mean, I think he's happier here than he was there, even though it's a bigger program, just to be real honest with you, because I think yeah. – Coach Goff, you know, being in the league, he he tells you the good things you, you do and he tells you the bad things, right? And he he has gotten a lot out of Cade. And I think Cade really respects and admires somebody like him, right? So it's it's been a good transition. Not dissing Coach Dickey, you know, the previous coach. No, he's a right. no, no, no. he's a very good coach and helped him a lot. But Coach Goff has kind of, I think, brought Cade to the next level, you know, from my perspective. And I honestly think that he's much happier there. I don't know if he told you that, but I believe he's much happier. 
you know, talking to you right after him, like he, he basically was trying to downplay his like abilities and say he's not that talented and this and that, even though he was an all conference. And then you're talking about 20 to 30 pancakes a game, things mm-hmm. like that. It's, it's really cool to to hear that, you know, dichotomy between him trying to be like, you know, humble and, and you be like, no, he's he's good. He, he knows what he's doing. You know, uh, you know what? Uh, he was trained by a kid, a guy in high school. I mean, a couple guys, Scott Peters. I don't know if he mentioned him. And he did, Dale yeah. Did. Dale Hellestrade. Dale worked on his footwork and stance, and Scott was really good at hand techniques. And Scott Peters is at Cleveland right now, Cleveland Browns, probably the best technical O-line coach in the country, if not the best. I mean, he's absolutely outstanding. So I, I do think that Scott really influenced Kate a lot, and that's – so every time golf teaches him something like they're teaching some new things this year, Scott already showed him that. So he gave him a real advantage. And when you have that advantage in high school, technical and physical, you can just demolish kids. I've seen him knock four guys out of a game, you know, and, and they just kept running off his butt all game long, either pulling or through his gap or, you know, skip pulling outside, whatever. And, and I'm sorry, I'm bragging a little bit. It's very rare for. Oh, that's the point of this. <laughs> yeah, it's very rare for a kid that's uh he played both both sides, you know, offense and defensive line, and it's very rare that you know your your player of the year in a conference is a lineman. Um, yeah. So it tells you, you know, it, it, they went to state state championship two years and semis, but all three years they led the league in rushing. You know, led the conference in rushing and. He had some great backs that had over 1,800 yards and one, he had two backs that had over a thousand yards and they were just, you know, they were, uh, it, he, he made a difference for that team. And then on defense, you just couldn't run on him. You couldn't run on his gap. He was a two gapper and you just couldn't run on him. If you didn't double team him, he's, he's yeah. in the back all day long. So for him to get that player of the year award is just so rare. And I was so proud because it's kind of a, that's normally a, a pretty, Pretty position. Yeah. You know, yeah. Quarterback, yeah. wide receiver. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I was proud of him. It was pretty cool. So he's, he was a heck of a high school player. Uh, and I think, you know, high school is very different than college, as you know. But uh, I think both the coaches, Coach Dickey and uh, Coach Goff, have really gotten a lot out of him. So, hmm. yeah. So before look, completely transitioning away from the ideas of Oklahoma State and all of that, it seems like the plan is for San Diego State to be in the, the power five in 2024. Cade would be a senior, right? If he chooses to, to, to use that extra year. And how, how much of an impact do you think that move could have on, on San Diego state as a program? I'm super excited for San Diego state because like, you know, watching the team and, and, you know, talking to the players, obviously Cade, you know, I've met a lot of the players, the power five program, like Oklahoma state, there's a lot of players at San Diego State that would start at Oklahoma State. Yep. A lot of players. I mean, so it's it's not like San Diego State drops way off. You might say there's a little more depth at that next level, but I think as San Diego State becomes a power five, they'll get that depth too. They'll start getting more players. And But I think they'll compete. I think it's great for the school. I think it's great for all the athletes. And, you know, I hope Cade, Cade's fortunate. He's part of one of those COVID year kids. So yeah. he actually has two years of eligibility if he wanted to. So if he wants to get a master someplace, which I care more about that as a dad, you know, that's in the sure. next 40 years. Yeah. I'd love to get a master's at San Diego State and playing in power five against great athletes. I mean, that would be fantastic. I mean, just uh, I was thought Cade came out here to see one of his buddies who's an army ranger before he gets deployed. And um uh, we were talking about playing UCLA and Cade's the type of kid. He goes, man, I hope I get to get to go against that DN. I hope he twists on me. I hope I, you know, cause he wants to go against the best. So I, I think you have a lot of San Diego state football players like that, that want to go against the best and are, are not afraid of any of them, to be honest with you. So I think that's great. And I think they'll do well. It, it might not be a, you know, 10 and two year, but I think they'll yeah. do well. I think they'll surprise some people. You know, last year, Cade had a good year individually, second team all conference. He had some games where he was graded really high PFF wise, but the offensive line struggled. They were kind of the whipping boy of the fans, right? The offensive line, this offensive line, that as a dad, you know, how do you approach that whole social media world when there's a few bad actors that go a little too far criticizing the team, the players, things like that? 
you know, I, I, uh, there's so much of that out there. I just kind of ignore it. You know, I, I try to, I try to listen to the ones that have really good feedback on why they're doing bad. Those are the ones you want to really listen to the ones that just kind of, you know, say they're a bunch of idiots, such as foolish. It was a young team, you know, and they played, it was a young offensive line. Alamo was really the only guy with experience and, and BCD, I should say, but even BCD, he had only one year under his belt. Right. So yeah. it's about a pretty young old line. Um, so you should expect that at the same time, I saw some moments where I thought the old line could be good. <laughs> you know, they, they look like they could play some ball. I, I think the hardest thing for these, these kids is picking up these complex offenses and picking up the, you know, the stunts that these defenses do. I mean, Maddox, he just, you know, destroys these guys in practice, which makes them better players because they see every kind of blitz you can imagine. Right. So I don't get worried about it. I just think it's development and they're going to get better and they'll be better this year than they were last year because they have more experience now. Yeah. And you mentioned BCD had played a year, but he hadn't played as the left tackle before. So that was new to him, too. What do you think heading into this year, not just the offensive line, but just overall team? What are your thoughts on that heading into the fall? Well, what is it, 75 days out? Is that, is that what it is, something like that? I, I'm yeah. super excited as a dad, right? I just, I love I love to see the kids. And, you know, there's some quality individuals on this team. Like Moose is one of the finest young men you'll meet. He's just a quality individual. So I'm I'm excited for this year. I think we're going to be tougher. I think we're, our, you know, we lost uh, some linebackers that and some D-line that uh, I'm going to be interested to see how we do on the defensive line side. Uh, but I think our own line will be better. I think our offense will be better under Lindley. And I think having Moose all year in the program will get better. Um, I think our running backs are going to surprise some people. But I think our linebackers might be better next year, right? And our DBs are always great. So there's a lot of potential in that this team that maybe a lot don't see because last year wasn't as good a year. But I think there's a lot of potential in it, you know, and it's the little things that will make the difference, right? The turnovers, the penalties those type of things. If we clean that up, I think we'll be tough. We'll be a tough out for anybody. That's really interesting that you, you, you talked about Jalen Maiden. Um, I, I'm curious, I mean, how do you, as a parent, like how, how do you develop that kind of strong opinion a, about, uh, you know, another player on the team? You know, it's funny. I, uh, I always, when I lived in, uh, when I had that place in Stillwater, I kind of had two places, but I, I would have the boys over, right. And we'd, watch UFC fights or something like that. And I'd cook them a home cooked meal or barbecue them some, some food. So I got to know the players. So I always tried to get to know his teammates and know what they were about, kind of their, their MO, what makes them and try to ask them good questions and learn a little bit about their psyche and mentality. And Moose just has this infectious kind of personality, right? He's, you can tell the team loves him. The team wants to fight for him. They want to, they want to win for him. Um, they see him as a natural leader, but he's not this, uh, arrogant, you know, cocky type of leader, right? He's real humble. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go execute out there. I, I think it's just talking to the, the, the kids and listening more than anything, you know, asking them good questions and listening and how they respond. I kind of make a, a judgment call on what I think of them as an individual. And I've been pretty accurate. And I think it's just spending a lot of time with those players, right? As, as Cade was at OSU and now San Diego state. So he's got some great roommates and so I'm always asking, you know, like Jay Rudolph questions or Tommy questions or or uh, Joey questions. You know, I'd ask all these guys that were roommates, I'd ask them questions just to try to get feedback on the players and the team. So I try to get perspectives and then I put together how I feel about them. That's great, man. That's great. I think uh, definitely reflects the conversations that, that, that we've had with Jalen for sure. But take us back to Cade's early days in football. He, he mentioned that uh, it's not something that, that you did. So how did you, you know, when did he start playing and, you know, did you imagine that, that he would be at the level that he's at now? So I was a pretty good baseball player and I was a really good golfer. I was kind of, you know, as a catcher and, and I tried to get my boys and both my boys to play baseball. They just didn't like it. <laughs> so I started coaching uh, both of them in flag football and they mm -hmm. love flag football. So then, you know, when it came time to put on the pads and we went and put them in tackle and I did coach them for a little bit in tackle through middle school. But uh, and I did play a little bit of youth football, but I was more into baseball. I was just kind of that was my thing. And I lived in Southern California. So we surfed and played baseball and 
played some golf. That was kind of the the gig that I had. I, I didn't know he was going to be this good. I knew he was tough. I knew he was physical. He was always a little bigger than everybody, right? He was mm-hmm. like 20 pounds at four months. He looked like a sumo baby. He was giant. Um, you know, so, I mean, imagine, you know, yeah, you have some if, kids, if we do, if some we do a commercial, home. if we do a yeah. commercial for the episode, man, we got to get a picture of that. You know, oh, is he? Little, I'll little, little sumo you. baby. <laughs> One of his teachers called him Sumo Man. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> he was just always bigger than everybody. And, yeah. and when, when he got out there and tackled football when he was 10 years old, it was a loaded team. He was the youngest guy on the team, but he was the heaviest guy on the team. And uh, they didn't start him right away, but they came to me and said, hey, we're going to start him at defensive tackle. People can't move the kid. His hips are just so strong. He's going to be a two gap or so they put him there. Then they put him at guard and then he's starting both ways by the end of the year. And I thought, wow, this kid's pretty good because he's two years younger than everybody and pop Warner. And he's just, you know, dominating guys on the line. So he always thought he was going to be a defensive lineman because he was just hard to deal with on the defensive line. He was just really hard to deal with. And, uh, and then all of a sudden middle school, he's six, one, two twenty five. You know, and you're going, oh, this kid's got a lot of potential. And his brother was a heck of a player, a DN and a right tackle. And his brother, you know, was a brown belt and karate and jujitsu and all that stuff. Tough, tough son of a gun. So he would kind of put it to Kate, which I think made it made Kate even tougher. Right. Because they were fighting all the time. But that middle school, we started looking for high schools where he could really develop that talent with good coaching because. In, in Arizona, you have open enrollment, so we can go anywhere. And uh, I think you guys do there, too. So we we went to a school that we thought had very good coaches that could help him develop. and But we didn't know he was going to go to the next level. We didn't know he'd be 6'3", 6'4", 300 pounds um, and athletic, you know, at that size. So, uh, But you could see when he was young that he was gifted. He could pull and he could wreck kids at a young age that most kids couldn't do. Heaping more praise on your son. Uh compared to most people anywhere, but especially kids his age, um, you know, these athletes put in so much work at SDSU and it, it's, it's remarkable is the only thing is the only way to describe it. Um, but how proud are you that you raised a son who was capable of, of, of rising to that level of, you know, focus, dedication and, and, and being able to do it for as long as he has? Yeah. You know, one thing, uh, both Kimberly and I have to give my wife credit, One thing we both tried to do was really kind of create a work ethic kind of for our kids, right? And hopefully, you know, pass that, you know, work ethic on to all three of our kids. And all three of our kids are kind of the same. They just outwork people and they outwork people in their jobs. They, you know, my oldest son is a certified financial planner. He's 26 years old and, you know, he's got his master's and he's just killing it as a young financial planner. But he just outworks people. And my daughter's the same way. She's selling genomic diagnostic services and she's like one of the top reps in the country. So we 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 always kind of push this, you know, you out execute people and you do anything you want. And and so as a dad, I'm super proud that they took that kind of encouragement and that kind of coaching and teaching and you know, parenting that both Kimberly and I tried to do. But we also we we did something unique with them. We forced them to be involved with something every season, which some people don't think that's wise. You should just let them pick. We forced them. We didn't care what it was. You can play ball, basketball, softball, baseball, volleyball. Yeah. But if you don't do one of those things, then you're going to actually go do plyometrics and you're going to work out. So if you didn't pick a sport, you had to go work out. So we were trying to build this discipline into their life you know, with karate and jujitsu and all these other things that they would do. And all three of our kids went into karate and jujitsu and that created a lot of wow. discipline. So we tried all these things to help them build that discipline. So when it came time, when they get older, they just out execute people. And I think that's what college athletes do for the most part. They just outwork and out execute, you know, the players that were in high school for the most part, especially the ones that, that play. They just got that discipline, right? They're, yeah, they're driven to to be different, and and we always called it talent stacking, and we always thought it should be diverse, right? You know, your talents should be all over the place, so you can leverage them in your job, you can leverage them in football, you can leverage them in anything. So it's worked so far. So we're proud of all three of them, and we kind of did the same with all three of them, if that makes sense. 
You mentioned your oldest son played football. Did he play collegiately as well? No, he has a genetic disease, cystic fibrosis, mm. which is really tough, but you wouldn't know it. He's he's like 6'2", 230 or so, and just shredded. I mean, he's just a mm. big muscular guy, but he was he was a gifted athlete too. I mean, he was for he would play he played at a smaller school than Cade but he played right tackle and only gave up one second in high school and and played DN and was a monster to deal with because he was just powerful and quick and uh but he if he didn't have that genetic disease he probably would have played college football too because he was he was really good and my daughter might have been the best athlete because she she's tall and lean and she was track volleyball softball you know all that stuff so basketball talented family for sure so this is a father's day episode as we're recording this it's a few days away do you have a favorite father's day memory moment gift that you can remember uh good question you know a lot of times <laughs> you're gonna laugh about this a lot of times uh, father's day is the same day as my are real close to my wife's birthday so it mm -hmm. seems like we're it seems like we're always celebrating your birthday, <laughs> and I don't care. I really I'd rather so celebrate birthdays and Father's Day. I think um, I, I think it's probably just the little things when the little kid, you know, and the little kids write you notes, you know, yeah. and and it's not anything special. It's just those little notes, just you know, telling you they love you or they appreciate you or those type of things that that mean mean the most to me, to be honest with you. So last question, you know, we did this for Cade and we asked him to give you a message that will play on Father's Day when the episode comes out. Do you have a message you want to relay to him? Yeah, keep grinding, uh, Cade. I, I, I'm i super proud of you. I mean, this is a big year for you and the team and and uh, be the best for your teammates and uh, be the best for yourself. I mean, you, you have a shot to do something special, you know, and being an all-conference player is an honor. And, um, you know, I'd like to see him keep doing that. And, and, uh, we're going to be praying for him to be healthy and, uh, get better every day and, uh, uh really help the younger guys now. Cause I consider him an older kid. I, I hope he yeah. helps the younger guys get better. And I know, I, I know this isn't just, I know this about Cade, but Josh Simmons sent me a note and thanked me because he said Cade helped him so much, you know, oh, wow. to get, it helped him with the mindset. And that's, you know, that's a nice thing to hear from another kid. So, you know, I want him to be that, you know, leader too for the team, really help that, that line come together because that's the difference. You know, if they come together as a line, they're going to be a much better team. So, you know, that, so that's, that's my message to him and enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a short, you know, it's a short run. You don't know if you'll play at the next level. So enjoy it, enjoy the school, enjoy your teammates and, you know, yeah. make the most of it next year. Awesome. Well, happy Father's Day to you. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, it was great to catch up and talk about Kate and and uh, we're we're excited. I mean, he's got a good good future ahead of him, and uh, it starts August twenty sixth, right? What do you say? Seventy five days away. I think that's it. I'm I'm super excited about these young men. I think they're gonna man. I think they're gonna surprise us. I can't wait for that UCLA game too. I hope we give them some trouble. I think we will. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. My uh my sister and brother in law are UCLA alums, so I'm trying to get them to to come down for that game from LA. So we'll see. There's a D tackle that played at Saguaro here in uh Scottsdale. It's kind of a big, you know, program. Um he's on that team and mm -hmm. uh I I'm dying for him to line up against Kate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you next time. Hey, thank you guys. Appreciate it. And appreciate you guys too. You guys do a great job. Thank you. Um, thank you. We want to welcome Jaden Ledee to the SDSU podcast. How are you doing tonight, man? Can't complain. How are y'all? Thank y'all for having me. Absolutely. I'm doing well. Yeah, thank you. you. Thank you for taking the time and enjoying your summer, I'm sure. You know, just getting started, you know, San Diego State played in the final four this year. Uh, in your hometown of Houston, Texas, you know, what was that experience like for you, not just being in the Final Four, but playing it at home? Uh, it was pretty awesome. I mean, I feel like I kind of understand it and appreciate it a little bit more now than in the moment. You know, in the moment, you just feel like you got a job to do. That's kind of how I felt during that time. But now that I've been home and 
all the love and support that I've, I've gotten while I've been home is kind of like surreal. So it's kind of sinking in a little bit more now. You know, in the in the final four game, everyone obviously knows about Lamont Butler hitting the game winning shot. But, you know, you hit the two shots before that to kind of cut that lead to one to give yourself a chance to not have to foul, defend, rebound and give Lamont the chance. You know, can you take us through the thought, thought process when you had the ball for those uh, last two baskets? Um, that first basket, I was just being aggressive. That's kind of just my game. I'm really aggressive and I like to be in attack. So I know they have like uh FAU had this big kid and I mean I'm big, but he was like, you know, seven foot. And I kinda yeah. growing up, I kinda, you know, me and my dad worked on, you know, a lot of guard things and I was a guard. So I knew I could beat him off the dribble, you know, kind of get him moving a little bit and get a bucket. And then that second bucket, um, uh, Coach Dutch drew it up. Um, threw it into Micah. Micah, he said, if Micah didn't have a shot, throw it back to Jaden and go score again on that kid. So that was kind of the thought process. Just, I mean, essentially in those moments, I was just like, you know, playing one on one in my head, you know, go score. So, I mean, that's just really the process. Okay. Now, we obviously want to talk a little bit more about the season and you know, next year, man, but take us back to, to the beginning. Um, when, when did you first realize that basketball was going to be your thing and that you were going to be completely dedicated to it? Um, I would say eighth grade, my eighth grade year, I stopped playing football, but football was my, my first love. I, I love football so much. It was so fun. I mean, I'm from Texas, so, you know, that's just the, the primary sport here. Right. Um, eighth grade, I hit a spurt from uh, 6'2 to about 6'5". And then I got, you know, started getting a little more notoriety in basketball and kind of started getting my first offers and stuff. And my dad was like, you know, maybe maybe basketball is your calling. So kind of started it from there. Yeah. Uh, talk about getting a little notoriety. I think uh, there was an argument that you were the best player in your eighth grade class. You're averaging 50 points, 15 rebounds a game. And you're at this time, you know, six four, six five point guard. Mm-hmm. And then you go through a a growth spurt in 18 months, man, where you where you get you grow five more inches. I mean, what was that like just for your development as a basketball player? Like what you were focusing on when you were, you know, a pass first point guard. I think you described yourself. And now you're going to the wing and then inside a little bit. I mean, how was how was all of that as you're just, you know, growing in a tremendous amount? Um, I feel like I really didn't. You know, when you're a kid like that, I mean, even now, you really don't think about it as much. You're just having fun playing basketball, you know. You notice you're growing, but, I mean, that's basketball still basketball at the end of the day. And I was just out there having fun with all my friends and, you know, just enjoying the AAU circuit and eighth grade basketball going into ninth grade. It was, you know, a transition period for me, but I thought it was, it was great. And I was just one of the best summers I've had, I think. You know, just a side note, you talked about football, um, I don't know if you heard this, but there was a there was a coach's press conference. I think it was right before the final four, maybe right after where Brady Hoke was joking about how he was going to recruit you to the football team uh, for next year. And then Dutch came in and said, no, there's no way. Did you hear that? Did you happen to hear that? I think I, I think I heard that con- uh, that uh, press conference uh, during final four. I think I saw a clip of it. Yeah, yeah. that's funny. funny. San Diego State's your third uh, Division One spot. You know, Ohio State, TCU came first. You know, you can, right now you can look back on it and say it was a growing experience, how it made you better, obviously being part of a national uh, runner-up team. But as you're going through that process from, you know, Ohio State to TCU and the obstacles, you know, how are you kind of getting through that uh, point in time? I mean, just like anything in life, my, my parents have uh, done a really, I think, I commend them on doing a phenomenal job with me, kind of just my upbringing. I wouldn't say I had a hard upbringing by any means, but my, mm-hmm. you know, my mom likes to say, you know, it's, it's bought knowledge and told knowledge, and they had a lot of told knowledge, and uh, I kind of just listened. I kind of heeded what they had to say, and, you know, my mom likes to say, you know, my grandma actually likes to say, you know, life life isn't. Isn't as easy as you think it is, you know. You're gonna go through obstacles. You're gonna go through trials and tribulations, and that's all it was. I mean, everything's a life experience, and I know a lot of people could have cowered at, you know, oh, I went to Ohio State, didn't work out. I'll go to TCU. Still, you know, most people could have followed it, but you know, some things you just know are meant for you, and uh, it's always a bigger picture. You know, just 
I think that would have been an easy way out just to, you know, be done and, you know, let things just happen. But no, I'm a, I'm a fighter at heart. And that's just kind of what I am. I kind of got, you know, two hearts inside of me. I got a I'm resilient. What what was behind? Obviously, you decided to transfer a second time. What was the ultimate reason? What was the deciding factor in coming to San Diego State? Um, I wanted to kind of get out of when I went to TCU. It was the style of play was really really for the guards. I mean, we had some phenomenal guards while I was there: uh, Desmond Bain, Mike Miles, R.J. Nimhard. So you know, the coach, you know, it really kind of was a more of a guard oriented system, screening rolls, letting the guards get downhill and. The bigs is kind of just rolling the rebound and, you know, just being tough, which, I mean, it's, it's your role about, you know, essentially I'm 6'8", six, 6'9", six, you know, I'm not seven foot. So, I mean, for me to reach that next level, I had to kind of show offensive versatility and show, you know, skill and things like that. So I just didn't think, you know, that would be the place that I would be able to show it just because of, you know, the system the coach wanted to run. Obviously, for that, you had to sit out a year. And, you know, you you said in the past that that was a good year for you. Um, just take us through that year, what you worked on, what you focused on, and how you feel like that's still speaking to your game today. Um, It was a great – I think I needed it mentally more than anything, you know. Like you said, it was – even though I made it through those years and, you know, I'm resilient and everything, I mean, I'm not going to say it doesn't take a toll on, you know, your mental or just – I needed that time just to digest and just kind of sit back and – couldn't think of a better place to do it than San Diego at that. Right. Uh-huh. So uh, just that year, I was just a lot of working on my game, a lot of, you know, kind of brought me back to high school days, just a whole bunch of guard work, you know, working on inside-out stuff and enjoying San Diego, enjoying the weather, and just, you know, cheering my teammates on, trying to get them better every day in practice. And, you know, it was a great year. It flew by. Flew by. And so then you, you start last year, I think you're <laughs> – your dad described it, you know, you're, there were so many players who were coming back. They've been playing together, some of them, for five years. And you're trying to find, you know, your role in it. Plus, you haven't played in a year. I mean, how hard was that initial just adjustment to find your fit in that team and then also to get back acclimated to to playing, um, you know, Aztec basketball? Um, Yeah, it was definitely a transition, you know, that, you know, year before on scout team, you know, it's kind of, Kind of my, you know, just, Jay, go out there and play basketball and do what you want. But now, you know, that next year is we have a team. We have great pieces. Let's let's try to mesh together and make something of it. It's not just you. And, you know, we have a certain style of play, play that we have. And me, really, that's really been my first year. I had to adjust. You know, I had to adjust all our defensive schemes. I mean, San Diego State has, the you know, the one of the best defensive schemes and I don't want to say complex, but, you know, just nobody really, or at least where I've been, the attention to detail that they have when it comes to defense is just new. So it takes time to kind of figure out and then you got to figure out where your shots are coming. And, you know, these these players have been playing this way. This is how we're going to play. And it's just, you know, just a learning curve. And I think I really kind of hit my stride towards, you know, the end of the year. And I feel like I kind of figured out what we wanted to do, how we were going to play, and, you know, how does everybody fit within yeah, yeah, I was going to say, like, was there a specific game where you feel like, okay, that game is what clicked for you? Because you, you conference tournament, obviously the NCAA tournament, you know, you, you, your game took off, but was there a point right before that that you could say, okay, you know, it's, I'm comfortable in this role now and what they're asking me to do? Um, I think I would say after Maui, I kind of, I, my gears started kind of turning a little bit and I was trying to, you know, trying to get my mind and body right for that role. And then I would say it would have to be, I think either at Utah state, I think I was like, okay, I, I know what needs to be done. And I, I credit AG a lot. You know, AG was my roommate on the road a lot. And he, uh, you know, kind of helped me through that transition. He came off the bench with me and I, you know, I kind of played off his energy and his spirit. And, you know, that's, that's kind of what, what did it for me? Definitely a good guy to to lean on and support for sure. You know, you after the season, you you had announced or you had you know the, the reports were that you were coming back, but you did enter the NBA draft provisional process to get feedback. You ultimately decided to come back for your last one more season. Can you tell us kind of what feedback you heard from NBA teams that you're going to be focusing on improving your game, and then what was the ultimate force to come back for for that last year? 
Um, so some of the stuff that I heard from the teams were just, you know, they want to see my offensive versatility. Um, you know, last year we I wouldn't say we play, you know, kind of play just kind of old school college basketball. Just we're gonna play defense, we're gonna out tough you. And, you know, uh kind of a modern game is people like to run up and down, shoot, you know, kind of positionless game. But um, so that was kind of one of the things they said. They said my defense was, you know, I'm ready to play on that level right now defensively, but they just want to see more of my offensive package. And I know I got that. I mean, everybody that knows me, like, you know, that knows, knows me, is like defense is something new. Like, I mean, I was always able to score and be versatile and rebound. But, I mean, definitely shout out to, you know, all the coaches and everybody, Coach Dave, Coach Dutch, Coach Act, Coach JD, and other JD for, you know, my defense has stepped up a lot. So, I mean, I think that's just going to make me a complete player when it when it's actually my time next year. And my decision to come back was, you know, I you know I could have did the the whole go and, you know, fight my way up and, you know, it would have just been a, you know, a tough road. But essentially, I have a great university behind me, great guys I love to play with. I mean, why not come back one more year and try to do something special and, you know, up my status as well. How much did you talk or share uh, feedback and stuff with Lamont while he was going through kind of the similar process you were? Uh, I talked to him here and there. I kind of gave him the space. I mean, we we was together for so long during the season. Yeah. So I, I understand boundaries. Um, but I talked to him. I know he had a few workouts and I would call him, ask him how they, how they went and, you know, different things he might have saw. But I was just, you know, here and there. You know, you mentioned AG. He's obviously graduated and moved on. Nate Mensa as well. He shot, has moved on. You're replacing a lot of guys. You know, you brought in two transfers, uh, Jay Powell and Reese Dixon Waters to kind of help, you know, the guys returning uh, kind of pick up the the slack from the departed players. What do you know about those two guys? Have you had a chance to catch up with them and how they could help, you know, complement your game? I, I haven't met those two guys yet. Um I think I've been gone or the times they were here, I, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to meet met Reese when I was getting out the cold tub, but it was just like a hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, type of thing. From what I've seen, I know the J Pow kid is really long and he can stretch it out a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then Reese Dixon Waters, I heard is uh what six men in the Pac 12, right? Last year. Yeah, that's right. I heard he can shoot, heard he can defend. But I mean, I haven't really seen them in action yet. So uh, your dad was telling us, the, going through the story, uh, we spoke to him about, you know, Ohio State, right before the the start of the season, backup center takes off. Mm -hmm. so, so you're the you're the next biggest guy on the roster, even though you want to play the wing. Okay, so you're the backup center. Then TCU, same thing happens. And then yeah. you, you so, you know, you're a team guy, so that's what you're going to do. You know, at San Diego State, you have they had all of those pieces as we talked about a little bit before, and 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 you know that backup kind of role behind Nathan Mensa was also there, and mm -hmm. you know it's like the same thing. How excited are you to 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 really be able to let loose and to show your entire game this year with the Aztecs? Um, I'm so excited. I mean, it's kind of one of those things you kind of just got to wade in the process. I mean, like I said, I'm, I feel like I'm finally having an opportunity, kind of to be me fully. A lot of people around here, people I work out with, uh, like Rashard Lewis, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, and Edward White. Those are my my guys since eighth grade. We work out when I don't work out with my dad, and they kind of said the same thing the first day back. They're like, "Oh man, like so excited! Like, hey, we you get to finally you know do it what we know you could do. You know, it's just how the cards fell, and you know, I think it's just you know, just enjoying the process. That's it. I feel like. Before coming to college, I didn't have any, you know, real intellect on the big man game and things of that nature. And I feel like I was just kind of rounding my game out even more. Your dad definitely described it as a, as a positive. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but what have what has the the coaching staff um, at San Diego State told you about maybe some of the different ways in in which you could be utilized uh, next year? Um, I mean, I we've talked a little bit about it, you know, just. Coach Dutch said, you know, he's going to let me put my full game. You know, he knows everything I can do. He's been watching me for, you know, two years, especially that red shirt year where I could really cut loose. But he said, like, we get it. We're going to go. We're going to try to play fast. You know, just different mismatches of those sorts, two-man games with, you know, me and Lamont. And, you know, just whatever those, whatever else the coach really has in mind. I mean, he's a phenomenal coach, and he's going to put us in great positions to be successful. Okay.
you know, we asked about those two baskets at the end of the FAU game where, where basically you getting the ball kind of face showing your face up game. Is that something that Aztec fans should be looking forward to seeing more as part of your game this season, uh, regardless of whether you're playing the five, the four or whatever? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I that's really something I, I've been doing way longer than I've been doing posting up, just attacking off the dribble, you know, getting downhill, getting to my spots, especially if I'm, you know, small ball five, I got, you know, seven foot on me. I got to kind of shake him, kind of move him, kind of use my speed. And then now I have this back down, back to the basket game. If I am playing the four, I got a smaller four on me. You know, that should be, you know, easy food around the room. So just, you know, little, little different assets I can do, you know. We we do this with uh, Aztec players just to kind of some fun rapid fire stuff that's like not non sports related. Uh, you ready for those? I'm ready. What's your favorite food? Crawfish. Where, where do you get crawfish at? Um, there's a place that my grandma gets them from. She brings them over. My uh, cousin Stephen is a phenomenal crawfish cook, or he knows how to boil them. And then we went on vacation and we had to drive through Louisiana. We went to like Bow Bridge and, you know, they have a famous crawfish festival there. I just, it's the Creole Louisiana side of me that I love. Mm -hmm. I actually brought the team over and we had crawfish during the final four. I don't know if y'all heard about that as well. (laughs) I went to a wedding in Beaumont, Texas. Mm. And the next day we, they, they went somewhere and came back with a cooler of crawfish and potatoes and corn. And now we ate that for like the rest of the weekend. Like it was good stuff. It's great eats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about favorite movie or TV show? Favorite TV show is The Office easily. Uh, you can watch that any time of day, anytime. I mean, I I love, I got office merch. I got shirts, I got jackets. It's just <laughs> me and my, my, one of my closest friends from college, Owen Bashiris, he uh, played with me at TCU. We quote office things every day, all day, and just normal conversation. It's pretty funny. That's funny. Mm-hmm. What about favorite musical artist? Favorite? Oh, I love, I like Travis Scott. I really like Travis. I mean, he's a Houston guy. Yeah. Um, Don Tolliver, it's another Houston guy. And if I had to switch it to kind of like R&B kind of vibe, I like Chris Brown. I think he's, uh, I think he's very talented in the, the dancing and the singing. And, you know, people look at athletes as, you know, he's so talented, but I kind of like to look at art as, you know, a different talent that people may or may not get the same, like, enthusiasm and things from. I think that's interesting, you know? Favorite professional athlete? Favorite professional athlete? Ooh, that is a good one. Right now, I, I kind of like Jalen Hurts, another Houston guy. He was a... Uh, Another guy of perseverance. I like his story, and I like um, what they did this year with the Eagles. And I like what his values are and how he speaks. Uh, what about when you're not playing basketball or preparing to play basketball? What do you like to do? Like favorite hobby? I like to go to the beach when I'm in San Diego. Mm-hmm. If I'm in San Diego and the beach isn't nice, I like to golf. You have a favorite golf course in San Diego? Uh, me and Owen go to Lomas Santa Fe a lot. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I love that place. It's the executive course. Yeah, the, it's mostly what like three three pars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good spot. All throughout, up until San Diego State, you wore the number twenty three, but now you wear thirteen. Is there a d- reason for the switch? Just needed something new. I think I was like, man, you know, I just I need to reinvent, I need to refresh. And then also the numbers they gave me, I was like, uh, number 13 looks best at the numbers they, they gave me out of the list. Um, Winston Shepard is also from Houston, right? And um, is he someone that you've talked to or as you're making your decision? He wore 13, which is why we bring him up. So I don't know if that did that have anything to do with wearing 13. No, I talked to him two sum- the summer after my rest year year. We work at the same gym, and I kind of just talked to him a little bit about everything. But no, nah, nothing like that. Nothing too special. And I know you just graduated with a bachelor's. What was your degree in? And then what are you going to be studying towards a master's uh, next year? I got it in the additionary studies with a focus in marketing, communication, and journalism. And then I've already started by um, my master's. It's in entrepreneurship in an MBA program. Awesome. What's the what's the 
I guess ETA on finishing that? I think I would be able to finish it either, I think, next summer. Incredible. Incredible. Mm -hmm. What a great opportunity. So this is the Father's Day episode. Last couple of questions about you and your dad. Um, what, what role has he played in just your your development as a basketball player? Oh, everything. He's he's the one that put the ball in my hands. I mean, he, um, you know, without him, I probably wouldn't be playing basketball. I probably should be trying to play football or something. Uh, <laughs> he's kind of taught me everything I've I've done with basketball and my game. And he's, you know, he's he's a phenomenal guy. I mean, outside of everything, you know, he always says. You know, it's not about basketball. It's about the connection me and him have. And even if I stop playing basketball today, he's still going to love me no matter what. So I think, you know, that makes me even want to play more and more for him because I know, you know, that's really what brought us together. And he's just a fantastic dad. I couldn't ask for a better one. You said earlier that, that your parents, you thought they did a really good job in raising you. And, and that said multiple times, I hope we did a good job. I hope we did a good job. So I'm always going to be happy to hear, hear you say that on the other way. Um, but what are maybe, you know, just at, at this young age in your life, man, and that you think about from what your dad taught you and how he helped you develop you as a person? He's awesome. I mean, my dad's, like you know, he's probably one of the friendliest guys I know and he can can talk and be friends with, man, anybody. And <laughs> I kind of commend him on that. And he kind of always taught me early. I remember he said, you got to be courteous to people, Jay. You never know, you know, what, what day they might be having or you know, what's going on, but you could be that, you know, that light in their day that turns it around. And I've kind of, that kind of stuck with me. I think he told me that when I was like six. I remember being in the car when he told me that. And, you know, just seeing him and the impact he has on people. And I have people, I'll be walking around Houston, they'll come up to me and ask me, hey, like, Lil Herb, how, how's your dad? They don't even call me Jay. Around here, I'm still Lil Herb sometimes. <laughs> right. so it's just, you know, that impact that he's had, just set that foundation for me. It just, you know, speaks volumes, so, you know. Why not carry that light? Absolutely, man. And the, the last thing, man, if, if you're willing, I want to turn over the podcast to you. Um, your, your dad's not going to hear this until actual Father's Day. Um, so you have a message for your dad that you could direct towards him on the podcast. Dad, I love you. I mean, I'm going to love you forever. Thank you for everything you've done for me and uh, taking care of my mom, taking care of my little brother. And, you know, I got you forever. And thank you. Just thank you. Jay, great, great interview, man. Thank you for taking a little time out of your summer um, to to talk with us. And, um, you know, best of luck on preparing for everything that you got ahead of you. And, um, you know, again, appreciate it. No, thank you all. Thank you all for having me today. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. We want to welcome Herb Ledee to the SDSU podcast. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you. How are you guys? Doing very doing well. Doing great. Man. Uh, you are obviously the father of San Diego State basketball player, Jaden Ledee. Just starting off, you know, San Diego State made the trip to the Final Four recently in Houston, no yes. less, where you guys are from. What was that experience like for you and the family watching Jaden on that stage? Uh, one, it's it was really unbelievable, as well as we hadn't had him play at home in five years. So yeah. to actually see him play... You know, for us, it's like 15 minutes from the house um, is amazing. Where well, we kind of file in. We've been to San Diego State for a bunch of games. We've been to Vegas and all these places. But to have all our family um, sit right there front row, sleeping on bed, because, you know, we got we went to every um, stop along the way. So we're on the road for four weeks uh, starting yeah. in Vegas. So we actually got a chance to sleep in our own beds, got up. Got to see him. He'd come home for a little while. So it was almost, but a lot more exciting, almost like high school, but like 50 times more exciting, of course. How far do you live from NRG Stadium? So our house is, we live on the outskirts of Houston. Mm -hmm. We live in Spring Woodlands area. So from our house to NRG is roughly, I guess, 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. But it's much closer to his high school. It's only like 12 miles from his high school. So really, I starting in eighth grade, he decided to go to a school really close to my job. Mm. Um, so he rode in to work with me every day from the eighth grade all the way through graduation, of course, where I coach at also. He went to and started in ninth grade. So uh, I don't know if you know anything about Houston traffic. It is crazy. So we actually have an HOV lane that two people or more can ride in. 
So for five years, I was just flying to work, getting their grade. And then when he went to college, man, I had to go back to struggling through, you know, an hour and a half of traffic just to work every day. So, but it was a great five years. Every, I mean, imagine having your kid with you every morning, dropping him off. He'd work out in the morning. We'd go to practice and we'd work out after, jump in the car, head on home every day for five years. So it was, it was actually wonderful. So final four, Lamont Butler hits a game-winning buzzer beater to beat uh, Florida Atlantic. You know, can you walk us through your perspective of that moment? Where were you sitting? What was the celebration like uh, right afterwards? So we were sitting exactly behind him where he shot the shot at. All the Mm. parents were uh, lined up. They had a split, but our group, me, Mr. Butler, and all of them, we were actually sitting directly behind we led into that play. Jay actually scored a couple buckets leading into that. So it was coming down late in the game. Um, of course, I, I was like, coach didn't call the timeout so you can just let the action happen. Um, Lamont came down. And then, of course, you know, everybody's starting to get a little bit anxious. And then the time's running down and he just pulled it. But where we sat, you can tell the rhythm was really good. He elevated well. The ball came off his hands um, like he had shot that shot in practice a million times. Uh, and then when he hit, man, you wouldn't believe how many people just erupted and jumped up, slapping hands. Uh, we couldn't storm the court because, of course, they had it all blocked off. But, I mean, just the anxiety leading up to it, um, where you're feeling like we're there, we're there, what could happen? And it hits the shot. And then, it, you know, like I said, we were all over. I'm pretty sure the other fans from the other schools were thinking like, Oh man, these guys are crazy because we're up and down the stands. <laughs> and, no, it was crazy. It was really exciting. It was really, really exciting. Yeah, from my perspective, um, I was seated. I think, I think just just to the the left of where you're describing. Uh-huh. And you know what? I don't think unless you were there, like, and, and they didn't really show on TV. Is after the players went and did their celebration on the court everybody jumped into that section i yeah. thought for, forget about storming the court i thought they were going to jump into your seats <laughs> <laughs> and we're all right there i mean we were all Mr. Yeah. butler and all miss Perry, all we were all right there so yeah. of course they had the media stuff so we sat a little bit under the floor so when literally when he shot it we're looking up into his back yeah and then, yeah uh, you're watching it that ball i mean you could tell how it was going it looked like it came off his hands perfect perfect yeah, no, that was that was my perspective. He he literally with his shoulders, he blocked the rim. And then as he as he came down, you could just see that it was pure. Oh man. Just, I mean, was, you, I mean, so you guys much. know the whole anxiety of a game. You're going is back and forth, you're close, you know, you're putting your head down, thinking, man, we, we just gotta make one more play. And to actually make that last play, I mean, just for the fans and all our parents, we were just excited. Of course. The Butlers came over the next day. We had a great time re-watching the game here at the house. Oh, wow. A uh, uh, whole bunch of people over. So it was actually a celebration, a second night and, and with all of us here. We didn't have the guys with us, but we had all the families and stuff there. So it was mm-hmm. it was a great weekend. Um, Very special. Bonding with the parents and all that good stuff. So it was really a great weekend. You know, and, and just kind of going back a little bit with, with Jay's journey, um, he's had a few stops in his career, Ohio State, TCU, before coming to SDSU. How do you as a parent reflect on your child going through a journey like that, trying to get to that spot where, you know, he's comfortable and he's he's able to do the things that, that he wants to do? Uh, one, I'm really, really proud of him um, because going through that journey, you get a lot of kids that might have given up at some point or just kind of mm-hmm. lost focus. Um, he's a young man that that no matter the situation, he's driven to do something. And every stop he's made, they've had different situations, but he continued to work on his game. The, the funny thing, everybody asks about that. Um, one, every stop he went to, he actually had great teammates. Matter of fact, he speaks and still talks to every kid that he's played with over you know, the Ohio State and TCU. And he's a coach's kid, of course. So when Jay went to college, we had one plan, of course. Um, He had always played guard. He grew extremely large. But anybody that knows college basketball, situations change. Um, Got to first school, 
went through preseason, was doing real well. The backup center quits. Jay had never played one day of center. But when the backup center quits, he ends up growing into being the second largest guy on the team and just been a great team guy. They asked him to play center, so he started working on center. You can even see the, the first year at, at Ohio State where he kind of was looking uncomfortable because he literally started learning how to play that position mm-hmm. in college, right? And then, uh, funny story that, he, he went through there, great people. Um, they treated him well, but we brought him back home, get to TCU, goes through preseason. They uh, got him the waiver, and then the backup center quits and transfers out. So, of course, <laughs> team guy that he is and, and he's just waiting for his opportunity uh, and he has no problem playing center just the style that those two teams played at center was more of a traditional center so the team needed and and uh, played center so he learned a lot right but every night after practice he would still go back and get an extra work I didn't work in his skill sets so um, fast forward TCU love those guys did really well we got some, you know, feedback early from then um, saying that, of course, people want to see more of his versatility, skill sets. A lot of people knew him from high school because he was a really well-known kid out of high school, and they want to see his skill sets match with the size. So that's when we started looking around. Everybody gave San Diego State, and these are other college coaches, right, gave San Diego State's coaching staff high praise as far as whatever those guys tell you they're going to do um and if anybody knows relationships and all that kind of stuff that means a lot so um since he had played center those years we took a year off um set out that first year where he got a chance to go back work on a lot of his skills a lot of the things that he was most comfortable with shooting handling making plays and then also gave coach dutch them a chance to see him in full which I think is huge. A lot of kids probably, especially coming into college, probably should redshirt for different, you know, reasons to learn systems and then to give a coach opportunity to see them. Um, so that year was great. Love the guys really did uh, learn the system, all that good stuff. Um, and I know you guys are going to ask this later. Uh, did we think they were going to be that good? When <laughs> all the guys returned, and this is literally true, all the guys returned, uh, of course, we saw some things a few different, but when all the guys returned, we felt that they had a shot to make it, you know, a deep, deep run. Now, nobody understands Final Four because that's not going to draw, hit the right shots, all that kind of stuff. But we knew they were going to be really good and felt that with the pieces they had, they could make an outstanding run and even have a chance to win it all. Because, I mean, they were pieced together. You get a team that is already connected. And then you throw in a kid that brings a little something different and a little more, you know, they're a little older veteran group that you know you could win. And we really felt coming this year, Jay and I sat and talked about, we really felt they could win this year. So it came to fruition. Those guys did a great job. It was one of the most exciting seasons that that I've been, you know, good thing when I played, we we lost in the first round. So to be able to follow him all the way through and go these different stops and, you know, um, enjoying the journey um, at that point when Winnie just, you know, four years before that, you have all these things going on, but to start having that winning, then it made all those other years kind of just drift away. Um, yeah. and, and just loved it. It's been amazing. You've mentioned about Jaden being kind of a point guard, you know, before he hit his growth spurts. I read somewhere where you were training him to be a better shooting Jason kid. Is that right? And can you tell us a little bit about that? So I played point guard in college. Um, In my era, I played against Kid a couple of times. And at that time, he was the best point guard out in the Hall of Fame and all that good stuff. So we didn't realize he was going to be this tall. So I'm 6'4", play point. We figured he'd be 6'5", 6'6". And that's a great size for a point guard. So I started him young. Um, I want to go back. So when, you know, this is Texas. Mm-hmm. So he did play football early. Um, he was an outstanding quarterback. But starting in the eighth grade, he decided basketball was his thing. Me being an old coach, kind of old school way of doing stuff, I explained to him 
you know, and I asked him this question, say, you want, what level do you want to play on? You know, pick a school that you want to go to. I, and I won't say the school, but at the time is the biggest school in, in the country. And I said, I got two choices. I can train you like dad, which is fine. You know, we'll go to stuff. Or I can train you like a guy that's going to go to that school. Um, so we're really hard on him. He'd work out. He'd work out literally three times a day. I drop him mm-hmm. off in the morning. Um, he'd go to practice and we'd do him and stuff. But we were focused on him being, and, and you guys might not know this, but Jason Kidd, right, with a Chris Jackson make move our roof. I don't know if y'all know who that guy yep. is. Yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, a mix of those two, um, as far as the passing, understanding the game as kid, and, but can shoot it like Chris Jackson. I call him Chris Jackson's make move years later. Yeah. So his whole career up until junior year, they moved him off the ball because by that time he was 6'8", biggest guy on the floor, um, coach's son. So he wanted to do whatever coach in the team needed. Me, an uh, old school guy, I would have still played at that point. But back to your point of, of eighth grade, I tell the story all the time, right? He starts off eighth grade at 6'2", finished eighth grade at 6'5". Um, mm-hmm. He's playing point, and a lot of people don't understand it. And I actually thought he played better as an all-around point guard, but he hit the national scene his eighth grade year because he was averaging 50 points a game. And he had a string of – like 72, 68, 68, 63, 58 in a row. Um, and that's kind of when he hit the national scene. The kid's been extremely blessed with opportunities doing USA basketball. He's been on every major circuit. He actually started playing uh, national 17U as a 13-year-old. Hmm. So when he got to high school, it was nobody that he feared because, he, you know, he played – Jason Tatum, Josh Jackson, um, Brandon Ingram, and I won't say this coach's name, but eighth grade year, summer ball, played Brandon Ingram. He's a Jay's a really good shooter. Their coach, who's actually played in NBA, college coach now, played Brandon Ingram a box and one on Jay. Hmm. So of course, at that time, Jay's six five, six six, so he had to change his arc and shit. <laughs> But 6'11", Brandon Ingram chasing him around, That's you know. Crazy. Uh, still finished with 10, though, for an 8th grader, finished with 10 points against Brandon Ingram. Good game, but we ended up losing down the stretch. But for an 8th grader playing against Brandon Ingram, still scoring double figures, where he's chasing you around, not going to score. It was pretty exciting, Austin. You said you were a point guard. So you played at Nevada and Texas Southern, I believe, at yes. the end of the 80. 80- 80s, early so 90s. I graduated 89, yes. So 89, 90, 91 at uh, Nevada. We used to call it Reno, Nevada, Reno. Back then mm-hmm. they just dropped it, Reno. And then I finished at Texas Southern. So my old high, my old coach, Lynn Stevens, is actually the uh, color guy for Nevada. Mm-hmm. So Jay got an opportunity to meet him last year after the game, which was really nice. I was glad that he got a chance to reach out to him and uh, meet him as well. So. What kind of a hooper were you? You know, back in those days, it was a lot different. A 6'4 point guard back then was big, right? It was not big anymore. Uh, but uh, like every other kid, I scored a lot of points. So when you get to college, you actually have to learn how to play point guard. Um, that was one thing that I tried not to do. I wanted him to go in understanding the game and playing it with a certain mindset. Most kids out of high school score a lot of points don't really understand how to play with other people. So uh, that's something that I had to learn, but I started real lo- long with him. But like I said, we made it to the tournament once. Of course, Duke beat us. So that tells you a lot right there. And they went on that year. I think they, Grand Hill, I think they went on to win the national championship that year. Okay. So, so yeah, it, it feels good that he kept going. You know, it's, those, even though you lose that first game, it's still heartbreaking every kid. You finally make it, take a loss. If you're supposed to win or not, you feel you are, and it's just emotionally draining, you know. So, but not a lot of people get there. Also. No, no, not absolutely. And you know, I think one of the things that uh, Coach Dutcher spoke about throughout the entire process was just he said this might be the team that got here, but we had other teams that were just as capable, and the ball bounces, you know, freak play, whatever, and and you you lose in the first round. 
But it's you all know, matchups too. You have yeah, to have the 100%. right matchup. Guys have to be playing well at the right time. Anybody can win. You know, we've seen this the last couple of years. The, the parity has been quite amazing where you're getting some seeds that's not supposed to be knocking off big name people, you know. So, yeah, you know, they they played in the first round against Charleston. It was a tie game with like a minute and a half left. Like one, one shot goes this way, they'd lose in the first round. They don't even make it to the championship game. So it's, it's crazy how that you can look at it that way. It looks like they were probably the most nervous in that first game. But take us a little bit about, you know, through some of that coaching that, that you've already mentioned, um, started the Houston Basketball Academy. I mean, just your love of basketball and, as a coach and, and just your experience there. So uh, me as a coach, and Jay's always been around with me, um, starting from a little kid. So I was a high school boys coach for years. Won a state championship in 2001. Matter of fact, Jay was with me. He was just two at the time. All the kids still can't believe how big he is. But during the summer, one of one of a parent in the area asked, would I do some training with her daughter? And then um, she goes, well, if I go get the 10 best kids in my area, would you coach them? So, of course, in Texas, you can't coach your own kid, your own high school kids. So it gave me an opportunity just to do some stuff during the summer. We were really good. I started them at 10, so I just did a lot of training. And we didn't lose a game for three years, right, in, in the state. No. So people started putting together all-star teams to beat us at that age group. Well, since we kept winning, a lot of the better kids started coming over to play with us. So we started a – it was Houston basketball. It was Texas Blazers was the team. Pretty much all our girls end up being really well-developed, Great kids, really great kids. I still talk to all of them. Um, all of them get an opportunity to play in college that um, later on down the line, a team called South Fair Nike Elite, which is a Nike team here, would always pluck off one or two of my best kids, right? And they would get a chance to play nationally. So at one point they came to me and said, hey, let's just murder. You can train all of our kids. You got a free reign to have them all and we can still have them on this top team. And then we split off and had multiple really good teams. Mm -hmm. So I did that. Like I said, one state in 2001. Then I wanted to retire because Jay was getting to the age where he's going to play in high school. Took off one year. Really good friend of mine who was the girls coach at Kincaid where Jay went to school. Her assistant um, ended up taking a job somewhere else. So she calls me last minute. It was like a week before the season. She goes, can you help me coach this year? I'll find somebody next year. but." You know, if you come over, you got a spot we can work. Jay, one, I'm pretty sure y'all saw the stuff about KK, um, mm -hmm. the facilities and all. It's like a small college, right? So you go, you come over, help me coach, but you have opportunity where you could train Jay with all this stuff and you have, you know, run at a gym and all that good stuff. So long story short, he was supposed to go to school where my wife coaches, I mean, teaches as a principal now, but they talked him into going to Kincaid. And that way I didn't have to retire because the girls and the boys play back to back. So mm -hmm. I was like, man, I'm out the door. And so he's like, no, no, Jay's coming. So you might as well hang in here. But it, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It gave me an opportunity, like I said, to continue that morning workout. We'd go through practice. Then right after his school practice, I would practice with him for about another hour, hour and a half every day. So we did that for eighth grade all the way through high school. Good thing about that program at Kincaid, our girls program, so long story short, I was only going to do one year. It's been 13 years now. Uh, we've, won, <laughs> we've won out of 13 years. I think we're at seven now, seven conference championships. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Jay's been around a lot of uh, really good basketball over the years. I've always taught him to think and play the game. Funny thing, you guys, like I said, people ask me this all the time. Six, five point guard, averaging 50 points in, in middle school, right? So I'm, uh, we're a little different. Uh, did a lot of different things with Jay than the average people. So all AAU teams were coming to me going, let him play 14U, 15U. He'll average 50 points. He'll get all this glory and recognition. I'm like, um, nobody's going to let him shoot the ball all the time. And then he was so physically dominant. I'm like, I don't want to see him score 50 points. So I started making him play 17U so he'd have to use his head hmm. and think the game, right? Because at some point, you're just not always going to be the most physically gifted guy or not. 
Here's 6'9", 240 now, but I didn't see yeah. that coming. Sure. Uh, that he had to play the game where he thought everything. It got to a point where the older guys would block a shot, and I would just get into them like, hey, man, you know, they know you're 14. They're coming for the block. Make them make the pass. You look just as good. So it made them think different ways to play the game. Back to where I tell you he picked a certain school that he wanted to go to. That school offered him as a sophomore. That's yeah. how hard he worked and how dedicated he was. And funny thing was that school, that coach, hadn't offered any underclassmen in years. They always waited till you were McDonald's All-American or something like that before they offered. He was the first underclassman they offered in year. Interesting. So, yeah, and that's just, right. I mean, basketball is not, nothing hard. It's a simple sport. Put in the work. The number of reps make you better. We prescribe to the Kobe method. A lot of people don't do this, but I explain to them, I go, look, most kids practice once a day. So I go, if you practice in the morning, practice in the evening, you're practicing three times. So at the end of the day, you're two times better than all your friends or other kids. Say so by the end of the week, you're 10 times better. By the end of the month, you're 40 times better. By the end of the year, those kids won't get you. By the end of three years, the gap is so big that you can't make it up. So um, I think the funny thing that caught us was the fact that he just kept growing. You know, yeah. we were dead set in, we kind of sectioned it off. As long as you were six five and under, you're gonna be a point guard, six seven. We did a lot of stuff, you know, footwork wise, Kobe footwork. Got to six eight, six nine. We were mostly looking at, you know, the per- people that I think most kind of comparative how he was coming into college would be like, and I love this guy, and he just retired, would be like a Camelo Anthony, right? Super yeah. skilled, big bully, kill on the glass, can shoot it, can handle it, you know, play making, all that kind of stuff. The only thing is people don't realize Camelo's a big guy, but Jay's even bigger than Camelo. So yeah. The coach sees uh-huh. him, they're going, Man, you're an elite rebounder. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> we want to get you a little closer to that basket all the time to get rebounds, which he understands, you know, he, yeah. he, he's gonna do what the team needs, but uh we're really Really excited about this year. We love Dutch because he always talks about giving Jay opportunity to do more. And, you know, he kind of really held him back a little bit this year because he could fit in with such a great group of guys and how the team was already functioning. Um, right. Because all those guys were like five years together, you know, four yeah. or five. So this year it'll be a little different. I'm, I'm taking it and he'll get opportunity to really show us where. And me and mom are so excited for the fact that. We haven't seen him just cut loose in a while, you know. So we're really, really excited. We might have to just be up in San Diego almost every week, you know. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, you know, another part of of this, of, of him cutting loose, of him getting to the, the biggest stage in college basketball, um, being a pro prospect, man, is uh, on social media, man, there's so many knuckleheads who, you know, they're just strangers. Right. Yeah. But nonetheless, they say ugly things, man. And they and they, they direct them at your child yeah. um, for, for, for other parents who are listening or just in general, man. How, how do you go about that ugliness being directed to your son and then being able to, to process, deal with that, et cetera? So we're, we're really not super huge social media guys. Right? That's a good way to do uh, it. <laughs> I mean, he, he's really old school. Jay has, you know, he he does a little a little IG, I think, not much Twitter and all that, because that wasted a lot of time. You know what I mean? Great thing about Kincaid, it really showed him how to focus on his study part, and then the other part is he puts in, you know, he's still to this day three workouts a day. He's still to this day does so he doesn't have a lot of time for it. Uh, me, I do see it, but I, I mean. It is what it is. People are going to say what they say in anything. If you're going to be a really good player, a per, you know, you have to just be mentally tough. As good as Michael Jordan is, they criticize Michael Jordan. So he's nowhere near. Le- LeBron might be one of the greatest ever. You know, so they're going to always have something to say. But the good thing is they have something to say. That means they're paying attention to you. All right. As soon as they just leave it all alone, then. You know, you're, you're out of there, but. He take it and thrive. And he, he's, like I said, I'm really proud of him for the fact that I'm sure he's seen some of it, you know, and somebody might, but he is really dedicated to making it to the highest level of basketball. He's been that way since eighth grade. 
So nothing is going to take him off his path of what he's trying to do. Me, I might have been, me being a coach might have held back some of his selfishness. I've had a great group of guys and girls that played for me. We've done a lot of winning. And he's understood that a lot of those kids bought into what I needed for them to do to win. And me and mom, I hope we have done a good job with him that he wouldn't want to go in and distract distract the team and do anything to take away from it, even if he feels that he can do a lot more, right? And he learned that a lot of individual accolades uh, aren't as good as winning. So they went this far this year. All the guys are getting opportunities to do different things. And that doesn't happen without winning. Now he's he's back on the map. All these teams on, on the next level know who he is. He just needs to come back out and show his versatility. They know he can rebound, play defense, and he's tough as nails because he goes to San Diego State. Um, the next part is showing back the versatility he had when he came into college. He's had a wonderful life. If it hadn't been exactly step by step, but I mean, Division One athlete, people know you. They take care of you. You're getting a great education. You know, um, we're lucky enough. He doesn't have to worry about a lot of those other things that some guy on social media, random guy that you won't never meet is saying something crazy. If that's your only problem in life, you know, things are pretty good. So I don't know how a lot of the young kids let that affect them. You know, if you put in the work and believe in what you're doing, it don't matter what nobody can say. Funny thing is, I guarantee if any of them said what they're saying and they get in the gym with them, they wouldn't believe how amazing he is. And a lot of people that get in the gym with now are just going, oh, my gosh, you know, he can dribble, he can shoot, he does this and that. But they won't know until they meet you. Right. So there's no way to just be upset about randomness. You know what I mean? If they really want he's he's a people person, kind of like myself. He loves people. Those crazy people wouldn't understand if he comes, if they came up to him and talked to him, he would just be the nicest guy random if they talk. You know, he can't do this or do that. Um, his thing is just showing people, you know. Uh, his his mom in an interview said a good thing. I, I told him this a long time ago. I go, uh, best way to show people is just put the ball in the bucket. You know what I mean? He was, he was a highly rated kid in high school. We'd go to gyms. People would do the chants, overrated, call them names, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I go, look, every time you put the ball in the bucket, they get quiet. That's the best way, you know. And, and you know, That's he scored it. a lot of points in high school, so there was a lot of quiet people out there. <laughs> what, so you, you mentioned earlier about this coming season, about cutting loose. But before that season, you know, Jay had a decision to make, you know, potentially turning pro or, or coming back. As his dad, what advice did you give him as he was going through that process? So we were lucky that we, we, you know, since I've been in basketball a long time and he got a chance to get a lot of good feedback. And then he, he's in a situation where he's at a great place. You know, there's no need to rush out. And a lot of the feedback was that if he goes back, um, plays a way that everybody knows he can play and show that versatility, he has a really good chance of upping his – um, they all believe he's an NBA guy. He'll get a chance to really up his stock. I'm like, why be in a rush? You know, um, you can go this year and probably have to fight, you know, through some different things and mm-hmm. back and forth G League. Even if you go second round or you get a two way, you're back and forth to G League. I said, you live a pretty dang good life right now in San Diego, man. What would be the rush of getting into that where? If you go back, you do really well. You get a chance to up your stock. More of a guaranteed thing then that mm-hmm. you know it's just a smarter situation to give yourself a chance to farther progress your skill and game, right? You can still do the same things there, but it's a little more cutthroat. It's more of a business. But when you go back to San Diego State, you got an opportunity to develop and grow with a little more niceness, right? He, he, a lot of his friends are playing professional basketball now. Um, some are in the G League. He knows how they're living. Some <laughs> of them overseas now, you know what I mean? And it's it, some days he's talking to them on the phone. They're going, man, I'm living in an apartment with two guys and we're eating McDonald's. You go, uh, you got an apartment to yourself at San Diego State, brother. You're definitely not eating McDonald's. <laughs> 
So sure. why be in a rush? You know what I mean? I know some yeah. kids do have right. to be in a rush because of a need for something. He's lucky enough not to have to do that. Um, he's got his degree already. He's going to have his master's when he finishes. And then that opportunity to either up his stock or be in the same spot anyway is next year. So why be in a big rush? You know what I mean? Plus, it's a different world. Even though he's he's a young man now, that is a different world that a lot mm -hmm. of people just don't understand. And we've gotten, I have a friend whose son who is an NBA and he talks to us all the time. And he was like, man, when his son got in, he goes, man, it's a different world. All the things that you did, it's not the basketball. He goes, Jay's ready for the basketball. He goes, you're a young man. It's a lot of other distractions that keep kids mm -hmm. from progressing. Now, good thing is that we hope we've done a good job and, I've given the Kobe mentality. So he just believes he can just outwork anybody, you know, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is, but it's a, like I said, he's living a pretty good life and you're living in San Diego, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We, we can't, you can't complain about that. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. I mean, not many kids go to the beach all the time. You know what I mean? All the like good mm -hmm. workout. Good practice, run to the beach for a little while, you know, get in the water, come back. I, I mean, that's pretty much a good life. Right? Good living, no doubt. I wanted to ask about NIL. You know, you were a collegiate athlete years ago, obviously before the NIL, and now you're a parent of a player that's in the midst of it. You know, how? what are your thoughts on NIL and, and where it's going and the impact it has on college athletics? So you, you have different... Um, levels or people that are looking for it, right? A kid like Jay, of course, he'd love it, right? As any young person, the more money they can get, they're excited about. But you really have to balance it. His overall goal is to make it to the NBA. So if you focus too much on just this one small aspect, it takes you away from, you know, what the ultimate goal is. And I, I think yeah. a lot of kids might uh, get caught up in that. Good, you know, it's. You know, some of them, and like I said, I've been around for a while. Some of them are offered certain things and don't receive those things, right? Right. Um, some of the money that some of them are getting, um, hopefully they're putting it away and, and doing good things with it so it can last a long time. But, you know, what's your goal? If your goal is to get that money and you, you know you're not going to play on the next level, then that's great. You know, you got your education, got some money, get your life started. Um, but if you're a kid that is really dedicated to the next level, you're going to focus on what's most important. That's getting an opportunity to play. I've heard of some kids getting the NIL, get to the school. The situation changes. You, you'll hear people say this all the time. The situation changes. And then I know one kid got a pretty good bag, but didn't play any minutes. Wow. So his dream of playing on the next level kind of diminishes because he didn't play, right? Yeah. So where if he would have stayed at the school or is that where he was the man, now you get a chance to show more. So, I mean, it's just, it's like anything in life, it's a hit or miss. You just got to know what you're looking for. And then I tell people all the time, each person is completely different. What Jay's background is, is different from somebody else. So somebody might need to take advantage of maybe a higher NIL, you know, or, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Uh, their family is in need or, or you know, so you just got to really take it on how it is. And then some kids are at the point where they go, man, I'm going to have a good career, probably not going to play on the next level. Or if I do, I'm going to go to school. And, and it's a lot of kids now that are going back to college, because if you get drafted or you get a two way, you might actually make more money. Or at least have a better living than those guys that are going two ways second. And then if you're at one of those schools that are paying heavy money, you're getting paid way more than the second round draft. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the game changes. Yeah. So it's actually good for basketball. I mean, yeah. the parity is great. The games are better. You're seeing a lot more. The basketball is better. When you have more mature guys, you're seeing more good basketball um, than when you get a bunch of kids that, might have one foot in, one foot out, younger, yep. kind of in it for themselves a little more. That, you know, talent will go so far, but basketball is still a team sport. And you got to be connected. That team last year was extremely connected. 
And like I said, the landscape of basketball is really changed. You know, I mean, the people that were the consummate winners early on with the younger guys weren't doing as well. Mm-hmm. And some of those coaches made adjustments when we got them some older guys. <laughs> Get back in the mix, you know. That's it. So so this is our uh, this is our Father's Day episode. Um, so as we're recording, obviously, it's a couple of days away. So happy Father's Day. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, you guys having me on. Absolutely. So how, how many kids do you have and what, what are their ages? So I have Jay, who's the oldest, and I have the youngest son, who's Kyrie, who's 11. So oh, there was a super huge gap. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Started. <laughs> That's <laughs> a different once, podcast. That's a different yeah, podcast. Yeah, once we get, got going, and then he came later. So it, it's good, all right, yeah. for the fact that I got a chance to do so much with Jay. Um, like I said, we started playing um, – circuit shooting ball as a eighth grade. Matter of fact, he played local regionally as a seventh grader, 17 U, then started 18. So we traveled. I mean, he did USA basketball. They were playing all over. So the fact that it was that big of a gap gave me an opportunity to spend a tremendous amount of time with him. And now I'm starting all over again. I'm a little older. My knees hurt a little more, but I'm starting <laughs> all over with my 11 year old. And it'll give me a chance to spend all my time with him. So it'll be like, you know, Jay was almost, almost an only child. <laughs> gotcha, man. Yeah, no, no, I hear you, man. No, I got it. this one will be the same way. You know, he, yeah. he's, he, now he loves Jay. Now I've got a backup trainer in Jay. So when he's right. get old and, and Jay knows all the stuff I put him through, he'll just transfer it over to his brother. So no, that's good, man. I was going to say, I have, I have a 12, 10, 7, and 5 year old. Oh. Goodness. And so they're, they're they're all bunched up, and I think that one or two of them I haven't talked to in years. So you know, just that's <laughs> how that is, you know. Like, yeah, that's that's, 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 that's a good way to do it. Oh man, that's I have I literally haven't slept in a decade. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you think about your father's days, um, is there any like particular gift or day or anything like that that you just remember as being like this was a great father's day? Tell you the truth, when you do AAU and all that, a lot of the times I've been in the gym yeah. during Father's Day. Um, I, I and Jay and my wife tell you, I'm not big and I'm kind of a low key guy when it comes to all those things. So me being in the gym on those Father's Days were just as fun as getting a gift, going out to you. You know how they do Father's day anyway? They'll give us a tie or or right. or you know some socks or something. So I'm like, Hey, at least give me the good comfortable socks. So when I'm, <laughs> I'm walking up and down coaching, I feel good. But no, I, I, I just love being in the gym. Mm-hmm. We've been in a gym pretty much every father's day. Um, I especially love it when he played well. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great gifts. I hope yeah. the same with my youngest. And I think it takes a little pressure off my wife. She doesn't have to worry about taking no. me around. Now, Mother's Day, oh, my God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a different thing. And, and you know, we, we, we've done a Mother's Day um, episode and a Father's Day episode, and the responses are, are exactly what you just did right there. Like, oh, you know, anything. And then the mothers, it was like, oh, there was this, and there was this, there was this. And oh, right. You got to take care of it the right way. You guys are much younger than me, so I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you a secret now. Okay. Have a great Mother's Day. All right? Then it'll make the rest of the year go by pretty good. Mother's Day, birthdays, and anniversary. <laughs> make sure you do it up, okay? okay. No doubt. And, and kind of like, hey, if they don't give enough for Father's Day, hey, great. Just we want a lot of peace, quiet. I want to watch a lot of basketball. So on those days, man, I'm we're, we're doing the thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, last thing, last thing for us, man, is we'd like to just turn the the podcast over to you. Um, this will obviously come out on Father's Day. Um, Jay will not have heard this prior to it. Um, but if you just want to direct a message to your son um, to, to close this out. I am as proud of him as any kid ever met, right? Because the dedication and determination in this young man is amazing, right? I went to things College and I know for sure by the second move, I'd have been like, hey, man, you know what, this is not. But this kid is determined. He works. He gets after it. He loves people that me and his mom hope we did the best for him. And man, we love him so much that all those things just, we feel makes him super special, super, super special. 
it's cliche everybody says it, but he is definitely my hero, right? Because the stuff he went through, even though it doesn't seem great, I, I was a big basketball guy. I know for sure, and, and my coach at uh, Reno might actually say this too. He, he loves me now, but it's a lot <laughs> easier to be upset and mad when things aren't going your way. And for him to still conduct and carry himself the way he does is amazing. So we love him. He's amazing. We, we're extremely glad you guys get a chance to see him and have him up there for at least one more year. He he is a pleasant pleasure for you guys as he is for me and his mom and his little brother. Now, him and his little brother, they're far apart, so they might duke it out a little bit, but uh, they love each other tremendously. Uh, he's a huge family guy. One, I'm going to say one, he's a as prodigal perfect son as you can possibly have for me and his mom. So and he's a great example for his brother. So hopefully he can do it twice. The second was a little more, you know, they all got the different personalities, but hope we can have the same out of second. But he's been absolutely amazing. And we love him to death. He's my guy. And I will be in San Diego for a bunch of games. See all the work <laughs> paying off. We'll do it. Well, uh, thank you again for for taking the time to to come on to the podcast and do this. I think tremendous insight into Jay and his journey. And I think, you know, one of the things with the transfer portal is you don't always get to know guys for yeah. four or five years and things like that. And so I think that just anybody who I know personally, and I'm sure anybody who listens to this, you know, just the more, more of a story and he, be, you know, just gets to continue to just be that Aztec for life that everyone can cheer for and resonate with. So thank you so much. Well, have me on again, and I will get in depth on the stories. And like I said, my wife's in the back going, "Hey, man, give him a break." But I can give you guys <laughs> some stories that that uh, like I said, he had a wonderful life and had a lot of opportunity, and it's all common culminating into this final year. And I just think it's going to be amazing. You know, the last year was outstanding. I think this this next group is going to be just as as good. And then his college story will be just awesome. Start one way, finish amazing, move on to the next level, and it'll all have been worth it. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Have a great night. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. You too. You guys, hey, anytime. I love talking basketball. Next time we'll just talk straight basketball or not. Jay, I do that way too much. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Coach. There you have it. Those were the four interviews we conducted for this special Father's Day episode. First on the football side with Kate and Dave Bennett, and then switched over to basketball with Jaden and Herb Ledee. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We appreciate them taking the time, you know, during their busy schedules, during the off season, their summers. We want to wish both Herb and Dave a happy Father's Day, of course. We also want to wish all the fathers out there, including my co-host, Paul, a happy Father's Day, and I want to wish a Father's Day to my dad, of course, and all the other fathers out there that are listening in. I uh, appreciate what you guys all do. We'll look forward to uh, both the football and basketball seasons coming up, and hopefully these interviews uh, gave you guys a little bit more excitement that already existed uh, to get to those the start of those seasons. So. That's going to do it for us. Thank you again as for listening. Thank you again for subscribing, following, liking, sharing on all your favorite platforms. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next time. You are listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison.